For those of you who ain't been here in a while, this is a very supportive group. We give everyone applause when they get up. If you applaud when they leave, that's up to you. Um, you can read your own, read anyone else's you like, or you can just sit and listen. Uh, housekeeping is pretty boring and there isn't much. Again, we are fortunate to be recorded and you can see yourself on community television or YouTube for posterity. And if you'd like your name published correctly, make sure Macy, who films it, has it. Uh, when we have big... Yeah, that's a good idea, don't you think? Do you want to add anything right at this moment of your own? <sighs> when we got a big group, we limit it to kind of like 10 or 15 minutes, but uh, when the groups are smaller, we got enough time. And uh, please don't watch your language unless there's a reason. I want to touch on it, but I don't know how far to go with it, Chuck. What do you think? The language invention and uh, depending on. Oh, it's starting. Okay. Don't say anything that Lenny Bruce would say. Oh, that leaves so much, doesn't it? Actually, we accidentally uh, saw a part of the Golden Globes and it was so refreshing. I couldn't believe uh, what was his name, Ricky Gervais, just telling everyone to f off quite something. So, anyone care to go first and then we'll just go as we feel like. Cora is very good at going first. I'm okay. Well, thank you, Richard. <laughs> Let's have a hand for Corey. This first one is called uh, Prognosis. There are moments when I forget about the lesions in my abdomen, and then I notice a mason jar filled with polished black stones, a telephone pole peppered with nail heads, a field rife with brown-eyed Susans, their centers cone-shaped, protruding, or your nostrils as you stand over me, reading treatment options aloud, though I only hear the pauses in between sentences, only see the periods scattered across the page. Uh, this next one is called Waiting. In the weeks I waited for the biopsy results, I had the same recurring dream. Standing at the French door, panic-stricken as a hulking black bear paced the lawn, pugnacious and unfazed by my attempts to spook him. He wouldn't leave, kept scavenging for food, stripping berry bushes, digging up bulbs with paws the size of snow shovels. Eventually, I worked up the nerve to reach for the knob, pull open the door, only to find myself awake, lying in bed, the scar still there, the threat still close. And then um, I'm going to close with a couple of sh really short poems, um, not as depressing poems. Country Song. Blue bicycle leans against the sagging barn. As the straw flower's stiff petals pluck at its spokes, and the morning dove's solitary song rises with the sun. Fireflies in a jelly jar, summertime nightlight. Thank you. Jim, would you like to come in? 
Sure, but anyone volunteer, otherwise he picks them. Um, in 1997, I, I had a chance to go to Vietnam, not, not as a soldier. Um, <clears throat> and in preparation for the trip, I read a lot about um, the culture. I have a friend who, at the time, I talked to about um, what might I expect uh, as a tourist in Vietnam 20 years after the American troops left. And um, anyway, I, I, the impression that I got before I got before I went to Vietnam was that it was a wonderful place, and uh, tourists were welcome. And um, so, in October of 1997, I went, and I was really uh, incredibly impressed with the people. Um, sort of superimposed against the horror of the war that you could see everywhere. Uh, the people were incredibly welcoming. And um, then there was this very spooky thing that occurred to me after I'd been there a day or two, was that there were very few men my age. There were a lot of young men and a lot of old men, but there weren't very many men. Um, so in 97, I was 52. Um, and it was just a way of uh, having this awakening about what went on there. So anyway, my days in, in uh, around Saigon were filled with amazing visions, and uh, I sketched out a bunch of poems, which I later finished. So I have three that I would like to read tonight. Uh, for, the first one is called A Night in Saigon. Silk shrouded girls, pale blue and white, glide through the thick night like s statues sculpted by the wind. They cross the wide boulevard, seeming to skate through the rush of rumbling motorbikes and the tide of noisy metal crashing through the flickering, glittering neon. As storm's cloud ascends suddenly through the mist and the fumes, but there in the panic and the swirl of the noise you stop, their grace and beauty beckons you to look back and consider the exquisite contrast between the splendor and the ruin. Then the sound of a single night bird sings above the din, one single note so sweet and gentle, it wraps around you like an orchid petal. The next one's called Visions of Vietnam. The armies have come and gone, but the images of my time have sharpened as I wonder how much has been forgotten. The swirling mass is crushed together amidst the junk of ruined lives, washed up sink stinking heaps at their feet. Dark inside of the street, an old woman under a tilted mollusk shaped hat hides her gaze from the ancient inevitable. Only in the faces of the old do I see the sadness that I share with them. But dignity, too. They carry it with them to the marketplace this morning to meet the day. But hope is not for sale today. It is bombed out and blown away. Yet from this place, looking out across the fields under the golden sun, the rice grows uninterrupted, silent, and eternal. When I asked my friend uh, before I left if she could help me with some words uh, that, I, that might be helpful, um, she gave me a little vocabulary primer. And um, anyways, one of the words was, I'm sorry. She thought it might be appropriate to learn how to say, I'm sorry, which is son loi. And the name of this poem is called son loi. In an hour near dawn, we make our way to the river, to the long dugout canoe. Soon we are pushing hard against the ebbing tide of the Mekong. From our gentle bow, waves are left behind, 
sparkling V's in the early morning sun. The rhythm of the wake bends the slender grass stalks along the shore. Vivid visions flash before me of another time. The scabs of war have peeled off and fallen away, but the scars remain. Along the banks, hollow craters pock the land, strangely beautiful, sculpted by bombs. Forms now lush with jungle grass hide the lies of what happened here. Hours up the river, snaking our way beneath the mangroves, the sun full up, dappled light splinters through the rich green ceiling above. Our boat slips silently onto a small beach, a long finger-like island at the sharp bend in the river. There a gray temple leans into the muddy earth where stone priests and snarling dragons have toppled to the ground and are now half buried in a nest of clay and shiny vines. We take pictures. Our guide speaks to us in a sing song of sweet notes and tells us of the ancient holy place. But she is too young and too pretty to translate the ugly truth. I silently ask, tell me of your mother and your father. Tell me of your brothers and your sisters. Tell me of your aunts and uncles and their children. Tell me about the dead, about the crippled and the maimed. Tell me about everything that was lost forever. She brings us to a place in the shade where we sit on hand chiseled stone steps. We have lunch served from a large weed weave woven basket covered with a pretty cloth. We eat small rice cakes and sweet and sour shrimp and mint tea. Her long, thin fingers wrap brightly colored bits of vegetables and lettuce leaves. She bows her head and serves each of us with a faint smile. We dip the lettuce leaves, roll up into a small bowl of tangy sauce. My heart is aching, but her grace is a prayer of forgiveness. Yet before I go, I want to say something. I wait until our eyes meet, and I whisper and say, in the only words of her language I have memorized, Son Loi. Um, the last poem, uh, I think many of you prob probably know, uh, I came across it uh, uh, serendipitously, I guess you could say, because of what's going on in the world today. It's called The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats. Um, maybe you all know it, but I'd like to read it. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack of conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly those words are out of, how do, hardly those words are out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and the head of a man gaze blank and pitiless as the sun. It's moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to a nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Thank you. Before the moment passes, uh, I just thanks Jim for the uh, painful serendipitous experience of feeling. For those of you who were here last time, 
uh, bringing, for better or worse, all that Vietnam stuff back again, you know, and and capped again by the second coming that we've all heard too often. <laughs> Who feels like going next? Gavin, give him a hand. Yeah. Hello. Um, it's been a couple months. Um, I think I've done this one here before, but I can't remember, and I haven't done it in a little while. Uh, call this poem Insomnia in Red. <laughs> I can't compete with your completeness. I can't sleep these odd evenings when you step past my threshold to shed your solar power, push the dark and dust back to the corners for everyone else. I wish you were afflicted with a reciprocal tunnel vision. Look at me. Eyes wide, trying to catch your glance through the drywall, trying to conjure your body through the darkness. Can't depart from the memory when you slip to my side for a kiss past my door, cracked light leaking across my floor to the corner of my bedspread. A pernicious silhouette, I am gutted by your shape. It will never leave my head. And now I can't sleep. I swear the bed sheets are burning. I'm turning over and over. I am jettisoned, spinning through space, end over end, same as when I emptied the contents of my everything to run through your fingers. Hourglass sand past slender hands till I'm vacant and panicked, sifting through the wreckage like, look, don't you want this? Like, look, I'm pathetic. Can I be your dog for a decade? I'm begging, knees bloody heart damaged. Look how well I wear the role of disenchanted romantic. But now I can't sleep because I'm wide awake and wondering if you might wear me once in a while like a battered bracelet under your sleeve or spare me an unplundered smile that could never be perceived as being laced up with pity. Maybe then I could sleep. Maybe then. Um, I've called this one homecoming before, but I don't, uh, I don't know if I'm settled on that. From this broken old tower, each cardinal direction beckons in gray blue hues, promising distance, time, tomorrows. But he chose none of those. Instead, he skipped the stairs like a stone plunging down to the most pure unknown. I think about potential energy, possessing power as a side effect of one's position in space, every part of you yet to be spent, an easy way out. I think of rays, straight lines drawn from the center of gravity, the middle of a man, to the pulsing core of our planet. I think of all the bodies pulled like exhausted marionettes to the bosom of oblivion. And I think of Icarus and dead tongues, dusty old tomes muttering in catacombs, and how God's myths and fathers all eventually fall, fade, and die. Um, writing's coming a little slow lately, but um, I look through this journal and um, there's some stuff that I'm fairly okay with. And uh, <laughs> it's funny, I just opened this one and um, I, I basically started to write it because I was frustrated that I wasn't writing, but I'm actually kind of happy with it. Um, so, untitled, this is from early December, and uh, the you is me, <laughs> if that's confusing. <laughs> you let a week lapse and wonder, where is my will to write? 
buried under my bullshit, I presume. Sometimes expectations are shallow graves, excavated with exclamations, the spade sharpened with unhurled stones and plunged again and again, the width and depth followed out of the earth, the X's and Y's, the curious process of building a thing by hollowing and scraping everything from it. You carve poet in your own headstone, but the darkened maw below screams mutely, drowning, choking out your self-important voice, and silence falls heavy on the hillsides, snowbanks of pages unwritten. A blizzard of unspun words sting my unfeeling features, the tongue frozen to this unsinging skull. The gathering crows more lyrical than this unstrung body, this broken banjo corpse, so be it. Topple the ego's intentions, cave in and hatch it, that empty mask it serves you not. Let rot the bard, the scribe, the dove whose song would not fly. There is room in this void for each of their bones. Their bemoaned plights, haunted nights, little dramas and bloated traumas bury them all. Till the pit named poet is full again with death, with life to its brim. And this breathing, seething, no one can resume the path, the pen, treading heavy over the sullied plot, past the dashed stone's proclamation, proceeding into a fresh laid canvas of possibilities, with something fresh and light and yet unspoken, hovering just behind his lips, his eyes. And, um, if you'll permit me, I'll do one more, because, uh, I don't know, because light. And light is the medium, meaning we are lampshade people, filaments behind your pupils. It's the kind of fragile shine best defined by its departure. See, perspective is the artwork. We could weave a million fantasies, every heart is still a dartboard. And like trees, you're adding rings with our capacity to grow ours. Me and more, you won't need all that bark and shining armor, cause in every perforation, an opportunity to shine more. And you're dismissing the point if you've been endeavoring to shrink yours. Ludicrous labors like an ocean trying to shake shores. Got really busy pillaging, forgot to learn to pay forward. And all that self-doubt left us stressed, cast out, and way opposite of starboard. Wrong port. Well, good to see some familiar faces and some new faces. It's been uh, more than a few months since I've been here. Uh, it's good to get back. Uh, I think uh, a lot in terms of uh, uh, being gracious and uh, appreciating just the simple beauty of this room. Uh, details like the ceiling that nobody's going to get close to look at but is just done with beautiful handwork it's just anyways it's a really nice place to be i'm happy to be as i always think i am among poets i am among among friends uh tonight i have four poems uh one of them's really short uh the first one well let's see one other thing i need to say hello and thank you to macy who's always here at least in my experience, and uh, it's always nice to be in focus. So uh, anyways, first poem, Watching Wallpaper. It is a cream-colored vinyl wallpaper with a design of vines climbing to the ceiling, adhered to the wall by the low bid. Bill is 72 years old, and I am in his shared room with his comatose roommate in a nursing home. He is laying on his bed and pointing to the wallpapered wall. He is only able to get out one or two words at most, and it takes a while to have him explain, with me filling in large ga gaps. It is a black man on a bicycle riding it underwater. On another visit, he sees on the wallpaper a two-story stone house on an island in Mexico. 
he has never been to Mexico. I tell him I can't see it on the wallpaper, but if he sees it, that's okay. He often cannot find a word and grunts in frustration. I try small humorous comments, sometimes getting a smile and am, and am unable to say how much is going on in his mind. It was not part of my hospice training, but I never doubt or argue with visions. His, mine, or yours. What we didn't know then. Kindergarten. At the end of the day, all of us boys kept in the classroom, told we had been bothering the girls and they would be allowed to go home before we would be allowed to leave. They waited for us at the playground. A woman with a book. I remembered a trip with one of my brothers and some entertainment we had at an airport near Washington, D.C. It was many years ago when airports were open to anyone who came through the door. You went to the airline ticket counter, talked to a human, got your paper ticket, and walked to the departure gate, gave the ticket to another human from the airline, and strolled on the plane. Nobody checked you, your name, or what you were carrying. I don't expect to be believed by the young. We had landed, gotten a snack, and found a couple of chairs on a second floor that overlooked where you would walk to the planes to wait the hour for our next flight. We soon noticed a reasonably dressed, reasonably pleasant woman with a slightly oversized hardcover book approaching solo travelers and engaging in conversation. If the traveler talked and listened long enough for her to open the book and show something in the book, she always got money from them. Every time. We were far enough away to be unable to hear anything or see what was in the book. It was so oddly compelling, we missed our flight. We had to change tickets, fly to a less convenient airport, rent a car, and drive five hours to get home. I'm still a bit uncertain and careful with women with books asking for things. This is a, a new poem, <coughs> Imperfect Mirrors. At my company's Christmas party a few more years ago than I want to admit, I found another imperfect mirror. I had started a business during a time of much irrational exuberance. The economy was healthy and the business did well. We were all pleased and surprised. After dinner, the 30 some odd people broke into small groups and small discussions. I was surprised there was entertainment and it was me. One of the salespeople put on a little skit. He did an impression of me. Dressed alike and of similar size, I was surprised. Is this how I look to others? Even knowing, at least in my mind, I was taller and slimmer, I was both shocked and unable to stop smiling. I'm sure it was mostly done with appreciation and mischief. I only thought about firing him for a little while. My mind drifted a bit while watching. Perhaps we should talk about all the years our mirrors, when viewed from within or from some shiny surface, seemed neither accurate nor kind. What has stayed with me from that evening is the mannerisms. I was unable not to see how well he owned my, my small physical, not always fully conscious movements. It seems unlikely I present myself to the world with more honesty than you. I had not understood mostly what is seen isn't me, but some odd collection of mannerisms displayed as truth. Thank you all for your kind attention.
Let's give a welcome to Carl. All right, cool. She screams as though I'm the monster. A year ago, she led me by the hand. My heart nearly combusted. She whispered while I whimpered. Yet I was the aggressor, the lesser of two evils in a victimless crime. Just a youthful mistake, they said. But I was branded the freak. We'd been apart for so long, and she'd never been warmer, never more intimate. She screams and runs away after we were unstuck from our silent standoff. I was caught in her headlights. Our eyes like TV static. She ran from the monster, the ashamed one, fleeing as I had when she let go of my hand. I hardly noticed the lawn lookers. The afternoon at the dugout where the monster preyed upon her, the place she led the monster hand in hand, yet I watch her run, left over encumbered by the weight of that afternoon. I remember being told there's a time and place for everything, and eventually the jagged, misshapen events come together and somehow form a smile, maybe not on my face. Or am I looking for the pieces and not the whole? But how can it be whole? I'm still here. Whole means death, complete, nothing more to add. I remember my mom loved jigsaw puzzles, finding a way to create a landscape from hundreds of tiny, cut up pieces of cardboard she never glued them together, framing what amounted to a banal picture whose best feature is how it was cut up with random order sprawled across the coffee table, pieces connected but still not quite whole. I remember being only nine, believing I'd found my most important piece, the one allowing my brain to assign verbal imagery to thought, solving an invisible conundrum I'd crafted with little consideration, but still severely unfinished missing a piece or maybe pieces of my brain, my heart, or it could be my soul. The soul is a puzzling thing, an intangible organ pieced together by the owner. There's no such thing as a soul transplant, and if there was, I'd ask my doctor for one. I remember being thrilled about therapy when I had nobody to talk to or repair soul with, a professional carpenter of the conscious. I'd cut up chunks of my brain, knocking down joists of reason and healthy thought, and watch the therapist try to repair the wreckage. I remember telling a girl she completed me, lying between my teeth, but what if I wasn't? What if her absence is proof of what? Being incomplete? Whole means death. Kissing her one more time would have been the death of me. So how long will I remain incomplete, or will I never be complete and eventually become whole, dropping dead before I can finish my soul and stepping back to see what it looks like fully assembled? Let's see. I've got a few more. All right. I went to bed at 4.37 the other day. Not because I wasn't tired. Sleep was my white whale, but when I went to summer camp, whaling wasn't a merit badge. I settled for canoeing. There are two types of people, those who have and those who have not. I have not slept in 30 hours, have not tamed the feral calendar, but I have a poem to write, so I have an excuse. I woke up at 10.38 today, after my 14th power nap. I have not gotten the recommended rest because I have my concerns that I'll wake up shaking just as I have from time to time. I have not decided how, how I feel about how I have not had sex for so long. I have started thinking as I often do and maybe I have to swallow my pride, admit that I have to let go of those I have not seen or spoken to in months. I have a tendency to think about myself but, not have, but have not allowed myself a morsel of happiness I have convinced myself I deserve and have not stopped feeling guilty. I have not written happy and don't plan on it. So what group do I belong to? I have my heroes, my contemporaries. I have a goal, I have a purpose, but have not been published, have not learned to wail, and I have my theories. I have an idea of who I am. I'm a form of serpent and have yet to gag on my tail. All right, um, let's see. You know, I'm just not going to do that one tonight. I'll do this uh, one, and then I'm going to try to recite a couple of poems. 
My favorite thing about you is you're a perfect stranger. I don't know your name or if you have one. All I know is I'm lucky to have caught your gaze like a foul ball at the World Series or some shit like that. Just like you, I know nothing about sports, but everyone compares love to a game. Guys score, or when asked if they'll ever sit, settle down, they say they're playing the field. Where's the ref? My favorite thing about you is I haven't said a word or communicated with you. I don't have to. You already know and are waiting, probably dreading the probability, the chance, zero percent. I won't. Why ruin my favorite thing about you? All right, and then I'm going to recite a couple poems. All right. Some jerk off made $120,000 for duct taping a fucking banana to a gallery wall. So why do I bother honing my craft, creating beauty from the ugliness that dwells within me? Is, isn't it art if some asshole will throw a bunch of money at it? Is it art if they don't? Is it fair that ramen is a staple of my diet while this man eats a $120,000 banana? Right. Is my poem deep if I allude to the Greeks? They say to write what you know, but nobody wants to read about having pizza face. Dominoes fall in sequence, just as gravity taught them. I learned for myself not to pick at zits, lest they form ugly scars, like cracks on faces turned to stone by some hideous creature who was killed in her sleep. Is anybody else, is it okay to make everybody else uncomfortable because you can't stand awkward silences? Who could, other than monks, librarians, and, well, maybe it's just me, but I really hope it's not somebody. Please say something, anything to break the ice. Is anybody else sick of social media, seeing who has a bigger dick, who drives a better car, who's going farther in life, spending time that could have better been wasted staring at a picture of a stranger's dog? Is it gross when I wear short sleeve shirts? Scars from burns scattered across my forearms. The doctor said that it'll take months, maybe even years, before they're healed, gone. Guess I'll spend a few summers wearing sweatshirts. Is it okay to cry every now and again, or will the drunk, who I haven't seen in months, materialize and remind me that I'm a faggot? Is it okay to use that word in that context? I'm <laughs> His inebriated vocabulary was very limited. Go run to mommy, faggot. I'm sorry to ruffle feathers, but I can still hear every slurred syllable, m even now, months after it last happened. Is there a term for the fetish for sadness? Dacrophilia is the closest I could find. The feeling of arousal at moments of emotional vulnerability. Is my poem deep if I shouted it to an audience? And then, as it winds down, the words trail off the final puffs of a midnight joint smoked in the back seat of my car by myself. Thank you. Chuck wants to go next. I want to say something before we go next. Who are you? Doesn't matter who I am. Let me say it before the moment's passed. Cole, I just want to say a cliche that comes from too many groups in my part, but I mean it sincerely. This is very personal stuff, and thanks for sharing. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. Um, now, what did you have in mind, Richard? I thought maybe we'd ask Chuck if he had Okay, I see some new faces here, though. I don't want to skip. Do either of you want to read? Okay. Brian? It's up to you. You want to come up and give it or, or just listen, whatever you feel like. Yeah. Okay, this is Brian. Thanks. Okay. Trump. Bump. Slump. Jump. That's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which were also poignant and brief, right? What's the soul of wit? Right. Remedy. Yeah. Ah. 
Sure. Jeff. Sure. Well, I, as you know, I, not much of a poet. I, I don't write an awful lot of poetry. I wrote a lot of other stuff. And since I've been told it's okay if I read my other stuff, that's what I tend to do when I come here. So here's some of my other stuff. Um, but I, I do have a couple of short poems that are not mine that I like a lot, but anyway. There was a period of time in my high school days when I thought I would be a writer. I thought I knew everything, and I had a few matters that I wanted to explain which had not been explained or even explored to my satisfaction. I intended to write about such things as life, death, love, hate, the human condition, pride and prejudice, man's inhumanity to man, and the questions of where did we come from and why are we here. I thought I might start with the question of why are we here and get that all straightened out before I went on to discuss the other issues. But I decided that perhaps I should first explore the question of where did we come from, thinking that that might lead me to an understanding of why we're here. I knew the story of Adam and Eve, but only in broad Sunday school strokes, not in great detail. So I turned to the Bible to refresh my memory of the story. Until then, I hadn't thought of the Bible as something you would read unless somebody made you. I began reading it voluntarily for the first time. It fascinated me, and it frustrated me. I began with Genesis, of course. I read the several accounts in that book of the creation of Adam and Eve. The chronology in chapter one, the slight refinements and somewhat puzzling inconsistencies in chapter two. I read chapter three about the serpent, the eating of the fruit, the fall from grace, and the banishment from Eden. I went on to chapter four, which contains the mystifying story of Cain and Abel, and then bogs down when all those begats begin. Chapter five is pretty boring. More begats, all genealogy beginning with Adam, except that this one doesn't mention Eve. It says that God created male and female and blessed them and called their name Adam. Called their name Adam, both of them apparently. So the first people according to this chapter of Genesis in the King James Version, my favorite because I, I like the language in that one, were Adam and Adam. The, the new revised standard version calls them both man, not Adam and the International Revised Version also calls them man instead of Adam. But so mankind, it comes from the Bible, you know, whether it should or not. Um, this, this chapter also makes no mention of Cain and Abel, saying only that Adam begat a son in his own image and called his name Seth. I happen to have done that myself. <laughs> I concluded that if you want to believe the story of Adam and Eve, you're going to have to accept a whole lot more inconsistency than I was willing to accept. It seemed to me then, and does now, as if the stories were told from different points of view, as if there were several different writers at work and no general editor. If it's the work of a single author, somehow the first draft got published. He would, he had, or I say he because I never for a second thought this was written by a woman, had a number of false starts, telling the story a little differently each time, and he hadn't gotten around to rewriting and editing 
out the contradictions and the confusing iterations. This information being so contradictory, I decided I'd need more sources of information about where we come from. But I've never to this day been able to find any that were anything more than speculation about various possibilities, none of which can begin to answer the question why. And I've learned that biblical scholars regarding these inconsistencies claim that the Bible doesn't tell every single thing that happened that you have to infer or assume or even, I guess, imagine much of it. Well, that's right up my alley. I concluded that Adam was not only the first man, he was the first person to say, don't blame me, it wasn't my fault, and point the finger at someone else, which explains a lot about human nature right there. I was left with a considerably diminished opinion of Adam, a great sense of Eve's having been done a monumental injustice and a disservice having been done thereby to all of us. She captured my imagination. How could I not love Eve? I did. I still do. And I know that colors my perception, but I don't like the story, at least not in its context. It's too capricious, too arbitrary. I mean, think about it. In the Garden of Eden, every experience was a new one. Was there anything in Eve's short life that would have suggested that she should be more wary of talking serpents than of disembodied voices? That a serpent might be capable of dissimulation or treachery? It was clear to me that Adam was pretty much a dope. Eve was the more imaginative, more introspective of the two, and I pictured her wondering later on, out there somewhere east of Eden, just what was the point of putting that tree there in the first place? I learned quickly what hard work writing is. Nevertheless, I wrote including a fair amount of romantic but ironic poetry modeled after Herrick and Suckling and others of the Cavaliers, but I didn't return to the subject of the Bible and Adam and Eve until a few years later, sometime in 1967, when I was reading a list of palindromes. One of them was, Madam, I'm Adam. It occurred to me that the name Eve, already being a palindrome, should lend itself pretty readily to that kind of wordplay. I made one up, even Eve. Then another, seven Eves. And then this one, ever Eve. Eve was on my mind. I combined her myth with another, and I wrote this poem. Atlas dropped the world one day. It fell on Eve, who accepted the blame. Short, I know. Ironic, I know. And romantic, maybe, given that what underlies it is my view of myself doing what Adam should have done, rushing to Eve's defense. I submitted it to Seascape, Ocean County College's literary magazine. A few of the people on the editorial board said it wasn't much of a poem. Some said it wasn't a poem at all. Some said, poem or not, it wasn't much, period. But some liked it. I agreed that it might not be a poem, but it existed, so it had to be something. Perhaps it's an epigram. Whatever it, it is, it was published. It pretty much sums up how I felt about the matter, and you know what? It still does, except that as I read it nearly 50 years later, I'm not happy with the last line. It's not right, and I need to change it, although maybe my little whatever it is simply doesn't need the last line. Atlas dropped the world one day. It fell on Eve. 
So having mentioned the Cavalier poets that I liked so much, um, I'll read a couple of theirs. This is Sir John Suckling, why so pale and wan, fond lover? Why so pale and wan, fond lover? Prithee, why so pale? Will, when looking well can't move, or looking ill prevail? Prithee, why so pale? Why so dull and mute, young sinner? Prithee, why so mute? Will, when, look, will, when speaking well can't win her? Saying nothing, do it? Prithee, why so mute? Quit, quit for shame, this will not move, this cannot take her. If of herself she will not love, nothing can make her, the devil take her. This is, uh, this is another by Sir John Suckling. These guys were 17th century poets. Um, who, uh, who had fun with life, it seems, as well as with poetry. This is another one by Sir John Suckling called Out Upon It, I Have Loved. Out upon it, I have loved three whole days together, and I'm like to love three more, if it prove fair weather. Time shall molt away his wings ere he shall discover in the whole world, in the whole wide world again, such a constant lover. But the spite on it is, no praise is due to me at all. Love with me had made no stays, had it any been but she. Had it any been but she and that very face, there had been at least ere this, a dozen, dozen in her place. This is one by Robert Herrick called Upon Julia's Clothes. You may know this one. You may have known the others. <clears throat> Upon Julia's Clothes. When as in silks my Julia goes, then, then methinks, how sweetly flows that liquefaction of her clothes. When next I cast mine eyes and see that brave vibration each way free. Oh, how that glittering taketh me. And so I, I, I actually, I didn't realize I had printed this one out, but uh, if you got another minute or two, this is one that I wrote. Um, this is called Havana Moon, um, not based on the Chuck Berry song, but based on an, a, a painting that a friend of mine did. But, but I guess I borrowed the title from Chuck Berry anyway. I borrowed a lot from Chuck Berry, <laughs> including my name over the years. Uh, Havana Moon. Havana's not so far from here, but we don't go there now. I remember when we spent the nights in laughter drinking rum, moving to a primal rhythm under the moon on Mar Azul. I remember well, but why? That was before we were born, and I wonder how I know, and I wonder why I see wooden ships in the harbor, quietly at anchor, furled sails wet with dew and moonlit white. And I wonder why I can hear a song carried over the water and the sound of a Spanish mandolin and a lovesick sailor's hands. Start out with a little um, trivia quiz. Um, what National Football League team is named after a poem? The Ravens. 
Yeah. Good for him. And why? Who? Oh, Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. Born and died. Yeah. 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 And so, in honor of Edgar Allan Poe, who was born on January 19th, 1809, same year that one of the most famous presidents in the United States was born, who is? Lincoln? Right. I'm guessing good tonight. Yeah. 100%. Jeffrey. I wish there was some Well, that's one thing I don't have. <laughs> Especially after writing poetry. <laughs> okay. The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, when I pondered weak and weary, over, a min over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door, "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber, chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I sought to borrow from my book surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating no longer, then no longer. Sir, said I, or oh, madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door. That scarce, I, well, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken and the darkness gave no token and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon I heard again a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what their is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not an instant stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord and lady perched upon above my chamber door perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, are sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Platonian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. 
Much I marvel this ungainly fowl to hear discourse, discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little rele relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living, living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such a name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the pallid bus spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my f hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling on my all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled the cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press ah, uh, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by angels whose faint footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God has lent thee, by these angels he has sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether temptest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted, sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, get thee back into the tempest and on the, and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon, demons that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted never more. Thank you.
And now our evening comes to finale with Bob Burgess. I'd like to say never more, but then I have to quit. <laughs> I thought I was going to go last. That's why I thought never more would work. It's got to be a response. All right, true apology. Um, well, maybe not. If my voice conks out, so be it, and I'll be reading them a little softer than usual, given uh, the current state of my affairs. So, I got some leftover Christmas tidbits for you, for those of you. Uh, who've missed them. They're a bit awkward. They're from years ago. What the hell? So it is. Uh, this I simply called <clears throat> talking to myself sitting by the fire at Christmas time. So this quiet Long life of mine be getting shorter by the day. And what the hell am I supposed to do? Besides sitting here trying to figure out just what it is that this precious little life of mine is supposed to do in order to find that one <coughs> last big play before it's all over and I too join the vast hollow of nothingness and memory. What exactly is it now that all the wise ones expect me to do? Suddenly leapfrog the bounds of all petty thoughts and desires, love, without limits and conditions, climb the still mountains of meditation and consciousness, catapulting myself out of all my small selfish attachments into the greater universe of God. Give me a break, babe. I'm only human. Easier said than done, my friend to say the least, while trying to pretend here and now to talk the talk, still afraid to walk the walk, still stuck in the same old lifelong cocoon, just looking for some comfort, calm, peace and quiet, relief from the pain, longing still for that long lost youth Christmas morning playgrounds, kids and toys sitting by the fire, lollipop presents dropping everywhere, dancing young in the sweet gentle rain when time was forever and life had no end. Ah. So talking to myself some more, a.k.a. the loneliness of the atheist. You know it's coming. You know there's no way out, no matter what you do. No matter how you pretend to everyone around, and most of all to that still, small voice in your head that you'll trick the inevitable by the force of your willpower, live totally in the moment, and not ever think dead. And how's that working out for you, old Bob? Can you find the right med? Nevertheless, it's the only way to get out of yourself so impossibly 
that you find the uncommon ability to really love someone or something else so much more than yourself that the future is irrelevant and there's only the present. Of course, if you're a true believer, not to worry such existential nonsense, you'll be destined to live forever in eternal blessed childhood, perfect Christmas presence. Praise the Lord for all your innocence. Ain't you lucky? Going to another memorial service now. for all my old friends. I wish I knew what to say. What do you want me to tell you? What do you want me to say? Don't you think I want to believe all the words I heard every Sunday? That there's a reason and purpose for everything. That every time I lose someone else that I love, that they simply left this imperfect world behind to be with the Lord above, while all around the bad live on and the good die young. I can do that. You want to sing hallelujah? I can do that too. Thanks for listening. And thanks for Macy for recording us for posterity. And thank you all for coming. And please come back.